Imagine a world without booze. Think about it. There'd be no Animal House. Ah, thanks. I needed that. There'd be no most interesting man in the world. Stay thirsty, my friends. Jimmy Buffett would have nothing to sing about. And what would we drink at a ball game? But how did we get from bland colonial ale to today's hoppy IPAs and hipster cocktails? Today, we're going to find out what kind of booze people drank throughout history. But before we get started, this is a good time to subscribe to our channel, Weird History. Leave a comment and tell us who you text when you've been drinking. Now, in this freshness. Ah. Knocking back beer dates all the way back to some of the first European settlers in the New World. And while it doesn't go along with the stereotype, the Puritans were voracious beer drinkers. When the pilgrims set sail on the Mayflower, they packed the ship with more beer than drinking water. A Puritan booze cruise. How fun. Pilgrims, including the kids, drank about a quart of beer each day on the journey. Though their beer didn't have as high of an alcohol percentage as today's beer, the Puritans actually preferred their fermented drink to the most likely contaminated water. This ale was so important to the pilgrims, a beer shortage is believed to be what got them to land on Plymouth Rock instead of continuing south. With their beer supply dwindling, the sailors sent the pilgrims out to find water. After drinking from a fresh stream on American soil, one settled Puritan wrote, I dare not prefer it before good beer. No wonder the life expectancy of these people was 40. When Europeans moved to North America, they tried to reproduce European wine, but the native grapes created acidic wine that was impossible to drink. The grapes that the Europeans brought over and tried to harvest failed to grow in the harsher climates of the eastern seaboard. As a result, for centuries, wine had to be imported from Europe. Thomas Jefferson made quite a name for himself in importing these expensive European wines. As with all imports, the high cost of imported European wine meant that only the wealthy Americans could afford to drink. By 1840, less than 3% of wines consumed by Americans were domestic. But that all changed with the gold rush of 1849. When the gold rush blew up, so did California's population. Naturally, most of these settlers became miners, but when they had problems finding gold, they changed careers. Some of the settlers who gave up chasing gold started growing grapes and founding wineries that popularized California wine. By the 1910s, 90% of all wine consumed in the U.S. came from California. I am not drinking any f***ing Merlot! While beer was the standard drink amongst the settlers, the founding fathers preferred rum. Have some rum, man. Dig it. Oh yeah, I re, I re. Rum was pretty important among the elite founders. In Medford, Massachusetts, Isaac Hall ran a distillery and sold rum that could make a rabbit bite a bulldog, which we think sounds good. On his ride to warn of the British invasion, Paul Revere stopped at Hall's house for a slug of rum. For sure, rum was truly loved by Americans. For years, sugar refineries dumped millions of gallons of molasses into the sea until they realized molasses could be made into rum. Although many called it hot, hellish, and terrible, or rough and disagreeable, hundreds of thousands of gallons soon poured into North America. By the time of the American Revolution, each citizen downed an annual average of four gallons of rum. If that doesn't sound like a lot, today's Americans, on average, only drink 2.33 gallons of alcohol each year. In 1794, George Washington sent Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, into western Pennsylvania to make sure whiskey distillers paid their taxes. Hamilton led a group of 13,000 militiamen who squashed the Whiskey Rebellion. During the rebellion, Pennsylvanians refused to pay these tax collectors, even tarring and feathering one of them. The whiskey tax was so unpopular that some of these distillers actually threatened to declare independence from the fledgling United States. During America's early years, whiskey slowly started to replace rum as the go-to distilled alcohol. This is because the revolution slowed imported molasses, and the new import duties raised prices everywhere. Lucky for Americans, the surplus of corn from the Midwest made the production of whiskey dirt cheap. In the 1820s, it only cost 25 cents a gallon to make whiskey. Plus, whiskey was marketed as a patriotic drink because it didn't rely on imports from the West Indies. Whenever you see a movie set in the Old West, the saloon bartenders always served up generic beer or whiskey. Marky, two whiskeys. But certain saloons had bigger selections. Old West saloons actually served up powerful alcoholic drinks to Sierra Nevada saloons called Tarantula Juice, a ghastly concoction of gin mixed with diluted strychnine. The name tarantula alluded to more than the drink's bite, which caused muscle spasms. 
Here's how it was made. Bartenders would take Carson Valley Gin, which was a wood grain alcohol made from turpentine, oil of vitriol, rosin, and essence of laurel, and mix it with diluted strychnine, prussic acid, and tobacco oil. Because strychnine is an alkaloid, tarantula juice probably produced an effect similar to Hell's Angels meth with a 1976 San Bernardino vintage. The erratic bursts of energy coupled with heavy alcohol consumption almost always resulted in violence. Local Nevada fiddle player, Dutch Nick Ambrose, is said to have created the drink in 1852 for hardcore cowboys, prospectors, and settlers. Most saloons served up tarantula juice in two tumblers, warning drinkers to hold on to the second until the muscle spasm set in. The second dose of juice would end the shakes. Fun times. The late 19th century has been called the golden age of cocktails. New mixed drinks like the Martini and the Manhattan were first invented by bartenders, and Americans across the country grew to love and appreciate the art of creating exotic cocktails. Well, exotic for the time. Take the daiquiri, for instance. Invented by Jennings Cox in the 1890s, the recipe included Bacardi rum, lemon juice, and sugar. The cocktail became so popular, it soon became the drink of choice for Ernest Hemingway and John F. Kennedy. In the late 1800s, Jerry Thomas, author of The First Bartender's Guide, also turned cocktails into an entertaining spectacle. Thomas invented the Blue Blazer, a flaming cocktail that he allegedly made with white rats sitting on his shoulders. The drink is no flaming mo, but the visual of the white rats is a nice touch. It's been documented that British sailors were known to drink as much as 10 pints of beer a day. But the warmer temperatures in the tropics spoiled their beer, so the enterprising seamen turned to punch. Made from distilled spirits, fruit juice, and sugar, with spices like nutmeg or cinnamon often added for flavor, this punch quickly became the most popular drink for sailors, and eventually a favorite for colonial Americans on land. The best part about this punch? Unlike other alcoholic beverages of the day, its citrus juice helped protect against scurvy and pack them with the calories needed to survive another day. When more than a million Germans landed on American soil during the second half of the 19th century, they brought a cold, drinkable lager that gradually replaced the English ales. And the Germans didn't just introduce new brewing methods, they even brought over new types of brewing yeast to create their beer. Breweries thrived across the country until prohibition put many small brewers out of business for good. Distilling agave dates back centuries, but tequila didn't become popular in America until the late 19th century. In 1893, during the Chicago World's Fair, wealthy Mexican families introduced tequila to a new market. Tequila proved so popular that bootleggers smuggled it across the Mexican border during Prohibition. Known as tequileros, the smugglers packed as many as 50 bottles of it per donkey to cross the border at night. Today, Mexico exports around 70% of its tequila, with about 80% of those exports shipped off to the U.S. On a related note, it was the World's Fair in Chicago that gave Pabst Beer its blue ribbon, and they've been riding that bit of publicity ever since. Prohibition went into effect on January 17, 1920, but Americans kept drinking anyway because, you know, it's America. People simply turned to underground speakeasies and bootleg liquor to get their buzz. Of course, not everyone had access to underground bars, so moonshine became a part of American drinking culture for generations. Though the Prohibition Bureau seized unlawful stills, that didn't stop moonshiners. Homemade alcohol, also known as hooch, was made up of horrific ingredients like rat corpses and rotten meat, meant to imitate the flavor of barrel-aged alcohol. To get it down the gullet, Americans mixed their hooch with anything that might take the edge off. One of the more popular hooch-based drinks was called the Bee's Knees, which included gin and honey. The Mary Pickford, invented in the 1920s, blended hooch with rum and red grapefruit juice, which doesn't sound that bad until you remember the dead rats. Have you ever had good cider? Chilled in a frosted mug, it's pretty great. American colonists loved it too. It was one of their most popular drinks. It was so popular in Massachusetts, the majority of its citizens older than 15 drank an average of 34 gallons of cider and beer a year. John Adams even declared cider a health beverage, starting each morning with a full tankard of hard cider. Adams must have known something. He lived until 91, a testimony to cider's mighty power. Many also claim cider prevented fever, laryngitis, rheumatism, and colic. Unfortunately, cider's glory days ended at prohibition. 
During the drinking ban, teetotalers burned apple orchards to the ground to ensure their fruit wouldn't become cider. It took decades for hard cider to recover, particularly because some cider apples went extinct. On March 22, 1933, President Roosevelt signed the Cullen-Harrison Act into law, legalizing beer with an alcohol content of 3.2% and wine of a similarly low alcohol content. It wasn't the kind of hardcore moonshine that Americans had gotten used to during Prohibition, but it was a good start in regards to the U.S. government treating Americans like adults again. So what do you think? Did anything good come from Prohibition? Let us know in our comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.